Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Writers Speak Wednesday. Today, we have Elizabeth McCracken here to talk to us. Um, so I'll start off by introducing Elizabeth, and then she's going to do a reading for us, and then we'll have a chance to ask her our questions. Elizabeth McCracken is the author of seven books. Here's your hat, what's your hurry? The Giant's House, which was the finalist for the National Book Award, Niagara Falls All Over Again, An Exact Replica of a Figment of My Imagination, Thunderstruck and Other Stories, which won the 2015 Short Story Prize, Bowl Away, and her newest collection of short stories, The Souvenir Museum. Elizabeth has received grants and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, and others. Her work has been published in the Best American Short Stories, the Pushcart Prize, the O. Henry Prize, and the New York Times Magazine, to name but a few. Elizabeth, we're so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for coming to speak to us. Oh, I think you are muted. Yeah, just that's my MO. <laughs> I, I never unmute well. myself. I never remember the first time. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Um, and I'm also, besides being some, something of a numbskull about, um, about Zoom, it's been a really long time since I've given a reading. It's been, I haven't actually given any Zoom reading. So it's been since um, we walked upon the earth and went places. And uh, so I'm a little, I'm a little rusty. Well, and we are a very generous audience. <laughs> oh, good. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I, um, I kept going back and forth about what I was going to read from. I printed out some stuff in progress. Um, I've got this, this book, which is coming out week after next. Um, but it's hard to read from short stories because they take too long. And I'm only, I'm going to give a, uh, maybe an eight minute reading. And, uh, I'm always jealous of poets who can say, I'm going to read seven poems. Um, but it's a fairly short reading. And I actually am going to read from this, a story. I'm, I, I'm so worried all the time, whether I'm writing or reading, that I'm going to be tremendously boring. No. Um, well, hold your, <laughs> hold your judgment. Might be boring, but I hope <laughs> not. I'm sure it won't be. So I'm going to read from uh, this book. Um, I'm also reading from the book because the one thing I've noticed about when people read from documents on their screen is they have that weird glassy look and they look unwell because their eyes are tracking in a strange way. Um, so I'm gonna read from the book, but I will try to look up. And I'm gonna read from a story, it's the first story in the collection and it's called The Irish Wedding. Um, and it's about an Irish wedding. It's about a, a young woman in her twenties who goes with her boyfriend who's pretty recent uh, a pretty recent relationship to go to his sister's wedding, which is in a big house in Ireland. And they arrive in the middle of the night and it's been raining um, and they are put in a room, which is called a snug um, in this house um, the night before. And this is her waking up in the morning. Her name is Sadie. Mere hours later, she heard the noise of children and then a barking voice saying, no, Thomas, no, they're asleep. No, Pi, come here. You'll play piano later. It was sodden daylight. The rain had stopped, but she could hear water dripping off things. Next to her was a paint sluttered upright piano. The electric blanket was cold. The air mattress had lost some air, but they were afloat upon it. Ireland, said Jack. Still, said Sadie. Yes, and for days, she fell back asleep. As she woke the next time, she could hear voices behind all the doors, left, right, at the head of the bed. She was in her underwear, locked in a secret room surrounded by Jack's family. Jack, she said. Jack wasn't there. He was already out of the room, God damn him. She said to herself in a whisper, Lenny. He's known by both names. No curtains at the back, but he'd spread out her dress on the ladder and it was halfway dry and she put it on and stood next to the mattress. 
She had to tick her toes beneath the fit and listen for his voice. There it was, and the sound of pouring coffee or pouring tea. She hoped it was coffee. He was talking to other people. She couldn't possibly go out there. Perhaps if she went around the other way, she could find her way to the car and her luggage and a toothbrush. Behind the first door was the black and white hallway. At the front of the house, a barefoot man looked out a window. He turned to her. He wasn't English, something about the spikiness of his haircut and the severity of his square steel glasses. He had a sandwich in his hand. Hello, he said. And then, in a calm European voice, did you mean to leave your car door open? What? She said, no. There's a cat and dog, he said, inside your car. Her shoes were by the door, damp as oysters. She put them on and winced. A cat and dog, she said. It had been raining cats and dogs. She believed he spoke metaphorically, but he didn't. The driver's side door was open, and then a Shetland sheep dog jumped out onto the drive. Already a Siamese cat was picking its way along the cobblestone toward the front garden. So you see, said the man who had followed in his bare feet. He closed the car door for her. I'm Piet. Sadie, she said, Are you, is that your dog? Neighbors, maybe? I don't know. Not yours. You didn't bring us a cat and dog from America. In the daylight, she could see that they were at the top of a hill, other hills in front of her in various degrees of fog and sparkle. Do you think they spent the whole night there? Piet nodded. I like to think so, yes. Like a children's book, she said. The embarrassed feeling of having been so exhausted, she left the car, car door open and a rainstorm evaporated. Where else would the animals of Clonmel take shelter? It must be a good sign. Piet ripped his sandwich in two and handed the unbitten portion to her. Breakfast, he said. Dizzily, she bit into it. She'd been expecting ham, but it was sweet and delicious and crunched under her teeth. Strawberry, said Piet, butter, sugar. He felt his chin. I suppose I'm getting married and should have a shave. The wedding's here? The wedding's at church, he said philosophically. I could be married on a rock by a buzzard or a bear, but not Fiona. She believes in God. God is everywhere, I told her, don't you think? But I am an atheist, and so my opinions about God do not matter. He carried her bag into the house and pointed her to the bathroom, which had a toilet unconvincingly attached to the wall and a clawfoot tub belly up in the corner, awaiting its installation. The sink worked. Her toothbrush had rubbed against something soapy in the cosmetic bag, and it tasted like mint and perfume and incompetence. She pulled on a clean dress, a pair of leggings, clean socks, stowed the suitcase in the snug, draped her dirty, damp clothing over the top, and went around the other way to follow the sound of voices to the kitchen. There was Jack, leaning against a yellow enameled stove, surrounded by English people, all of them dressed like stable hands. Him, too, in yesterday's clothing. By sleeping in it, he seemed to have achieved the correct level of rumple. The room smelled of cigarettes and sausage. She studied Jack's face for some evidence of guilt over abandoning her. Instead, he said, there she is. She went to him, but he did not, as he would have in America, put his arm around her. Sit, he said to her. His voice was full of kindness. You could tell how happy he was to see her. Sit, sit. What can I get you? Let me make you some coffee. This is Sadie, he said to the English people. They were all women, with the exception of one small boy who abruptly opened the door to the snug and went to bang on the piano, and a man with giant hands who was putting away dishes in a cupboard. These were people who called Jack Lenny. They looked just the sort. Sadie. He said, you've met Fiona and here's Katie and Eloise, my other sisters. There's Katie's husband, Paul. Together, Jack and his sisters looked like a full toolbox, hatchet, knife, spade, trowel. Sadie, having been sat, understood that she was not to make physical contact with any of the people present. She was about to say hello when an older man came through a door in the corner of the kitchen, shaking water from his hands. Jack's father it had to be. He had Jack's thick curls, though wider and tidier. He was a tall man, serrated, 
Sadie felt cut already as she always would feel around him. With extraordinarily blue eyes, he must have been vain about. He wore a sweater one shade darker, peacock, to bring them out. Still there, he said in a jubilant voice. For fuck's sake, said Jack. It's not, said the woman who's let them in the night before, Fiona, the bride. She was washing dishes and smoking a cigarette. It can't be. Well done, Lenny, said their father. What, said Sadie. I think it's a lovely present that Len has brought, said Jack's father. Then he winced. The man at the cupboards noted the wincing. Pie, he shouted into the snug, stop torturing that piano. The piano stopped for half a second and started again with more deliberation. A work of art, really, said one of the sisters. Sadie looked at Jack, lost. He shook his head. A very honored wedding guest, said Fiona. Do fuck off, said Jack, in one of the exaggerated English accents he sometimes slid into. He had dozens of them, similar, but for subtly different uses, like the blades of a penknife. He added, would you? The lingering log of Len, said Jack's father. Then the little boy was back and he said to Sadie with the same jubilation, it's a turd won't flush. He set his hand on Sadie's knee. He had never been so glad for human touch in her life. The assembled Valerts laughed silently. It was a laugh Sadie recognized from Jack. To make noise would ruin the joke. It is tenacious, said Fiona. It's quite a tenacious turd. Well, that's right, Jack's father said to Sadie, as though noticing her for the first time. He regarded, he regarded her with an intensity she couldn't interpret. Kindly? aggressive, flirtatious. He said, Americans don't appreciate the scatological, do they? We do, said Sadie, thinking, I don't. And I'll stop there. Thank you. That was so nice. It's always so nice to hear an author reading in their own voice. Um, yeah, that was so nice. So let me just see if anybody has any questions questions. Um, uh, we have a few people who are really loving some of the phrasing you have. Mint perfume and incompetence. Paul says exactly been there. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to write them in the chat and I'm going to get us started with one. So um, I am wondering about your writing process. And so you've written both short stories and novels and a memoir as well. Um, but specifically with the fiction, I'm wondering how do you decide if a story wants to be a short story or a novel? And then how does that affect how you approach it? Do you, you know, do you have to do like much more outlining for a novel than a short story or what's that all about? I, I have never outlined a thing in my entire life. I sometimes outline things after I've already written them to sort of try to see what the shape is. But every time I've ever started an outline, which you know, let me know it, and then I do with good intentions and I write one and then Roman numeral one and then capital letter A and then little a. And I just have a big slanting line across my page and I never ever get to any form of two whatsoever. Um, because no matter how I think about something that I'm gonna write before I start writing it, actually writing it changes my mind entirely. So I've, I've, learned, I've learned that I'm sort of untidy and inefficient as a writer and I need to get the words on the page and then see um, what they are. I feel like over the years, my answer to the question of how do you know whether something's a story or a novel has changed a lot. It used to be that I would say, well, if I'm writing a novel, any idea I have, I try to cram into the novel. Um, and as a result, I think over the years, there were a lot of ideas I had that I never ended up writing that much about because I would try to put them in the novel. Then somebody would say, this actually has nothing to do with the novel that you're writing whatsoever. And I would take them out. And now I'm more likely to, I come up with short stories when I travel. Um, and I write novels at home. That's essentially how I work these days. Um, and it doesn't necessarily that I do the writing of the short stories when I travel, but for the most part, I come up with the ideas um, for them. And so I sort of know the difference. And I, and I think it has something to do just with being, I mean, 
obviously I have not written a short story in a year because I have not gone anywhere um, or at least not, I haven't gone anywhere that's not uh, Texas. Um, but there's something about being out of context that helps me think of short stories and that maybe, um, I don't even know whether this is true, but it feels true as I'm saying it right now. By the time I get to the end of the sentence, I might not think it's true. But I think often short stories are about being out of context. You know, they're one piece of a life taken out of the context of the rest of the life. And, and, and novels are, themselves are about context. They're about putting those moments in the context of 24 hours or a year or a whole life or many generations that they're, that's what they're about. That's a really fascinating um, just insight into how you work and then also what a short story is. I think even in the piece you just read to us, Sadie is out of context there. So yeah, that was a great example. Um, Carla is wondering in the chat, she says that um, you have such fantastic titles for your books and short stories. And she's wondering if you could talk about the titles a little bit more. Sure. Um, very passionate about titles. And I feel like short story titles and novel titles are different. I like novel titles that could only be the title of that novel. I hate generic titles. Um, and I know a lot of people really like them and they, they, they think, oh, this sounds like other books that were successful, so I'm gonna name the book that. But I, I, they feel like in the same way that some people like to name their children the name that they've heard a million times and they really like, I, I want my books to, to feel distinctive. Um, and for a long time, my titles tended to be quite long and now, and now they're, they're, they're a bit shorter. I like, um, for, for novels, I think of a title as being, it's the first thing you know about a novel. Um, so I want it to be distinct and striking and for there to be at least one memorable word in it. Um, I mean, my memoir is titled something so long that even I have to stop beforehand and get the words in the right order. Um, I still think it's the right title for that memoir, but I wouldn't want to, if I were, if I wanted to sell a lot of copies of a novel, that's probably not such a great idea. Um, and, and sometimes I bend things to titles. Um, when I, this book is called The Souvenir Museum. There's a short story called The Souvenir Museum. And that's because when I was in Denmark, I went to the Souvenir Museum. And when I was there, I thought, I mean, it was a very strange place and it appears in the title story. Um, but I thought immediately it would be a great title for a book because it's got that combination of ephemeral and permanent that, um, that interests me as a writer always. Um, with short stories, I think of them not so much as the first thing you know about them, but almost the first line of the um, story. And sometimes I name things at the last minute and I just do my best and every time, just like with a kid, like you might look at your kid and go, God, you know, you don't really seem like a Rachel after all. So sometimes I look at my stories and go, yeah, that was, I don't know why, Tyler. It's fine. Did you no harm? It's not particularly memorable or great, but. Um, I like I like small form writing, fortune cookies and Twitter and signpost boards outside of churches. And I like titles a lot too. That's cool. That's really interesting to hear. I personally struggle a lot with titles. Um, so good stuff to think about. I will say that when I was younger um, and in an MFA program, um, I had a friend who titled all my, my stories for me. Really? And and I really, and I think there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that and no shame in it. And it really was one of those things that he titled a bunch of my stories. And then um, he gave me a title I really didn't like. And I went, you're fired. And then I started titling my own story. He was very, he was very good at titles. And sometimes it's hard because you can't, you've been so inside of the, the work. I think that's particularly true for short stories. You've been inside of it. And so sort of, it's sort of hard to know what to call it. I was going to ask that actually, if, if any of the titles he gave you were surprising to you, because sometimes I find that it's like, I can't see the wood for the trees. Like I've, I've lost sight of what 
I'm even writing about? <laughs> yeah, I think they all did. In my first collection of stories, um, I have a story about a tattoo artist and it was called, I think at first it was called Illuminations and then it was called Indelible Ink. These are both really bad titles for a short story about a tattoo artist. They're like, they're two on the nose. Like, get it, get it, indelible ink. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he took a line out of that story, which was, it's bad luck to die. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, that, there's something, I don't know, sort of Flannery O'Connor adjacent to, to it. Yeah. Um, and it's easy to remember. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think there were others that he titled that I liked. And as I say, then at some point I fired him because I, because I, so, to some extent, because he taught me how to, how to title things. Yeah. You had learned, you yeah. learned from him. Um, speaking of learning things, um, Genevieve Crane is wondering about um, how you break the rules in your fiction, specifically with the short story, It's Not You. Um, and so she's wondering how, if you can chat a little bit about breaking the rules, such as in that story, how you break the fourth wall. Um, all right. There are no rules. That's well, how I break scary. them. <laughs> there scary. are no rules. <laughs> um, I actually feel this very firmly that when short stories don't work, it's not because they are breaking rules inscribed upon a tablet somewhere, you know, in Ernest Hemingway's basement. Um, it's that they're breaking the rules that they've set up for themselves. So, um, and I, I feel that quite, quite strongly. And sometimes I forget, sometimes I'm writing a story and I think, oh, this has to happen this way, this happens, has to happen that, you know, maybe you can't change points of view here. And then I remember, um, so this is how I always explain it to my, to my students. I, one of my, a different friend in graduate school, my friend Bruce Holbert, um, who's a wonderful writer and had been a basketball coach before he came to grad school. And he once told me that coaching basketball was entirely a matter of saying, don't stand like, nice shot. And I feel like teaching basketball, I'm sorry, teaching, I do not teach basketball. Um, teaching fiction is like that because that's the rule is that you have to make the shot. You can fail writing a short story 100%, but I never think that it's a, because a rule has been broken. You might go against convention. You might, you know, you might decide to write a story that doesn't look like a normal story. But I also, you know, I feel pretty strongly that, um, uh, normal stories are not the only kind of stories there are. Stories that look like other stories we've read a million times. Um, some of the story, those stories that you read a million times are great, but they're not manual books. They're not, you don't have to write the stories that look like those stories. It reminds me of something Matt Clam has said. I'm taking a class with him this semester and he talks about how you kind of have to find the way your story wants to be told. And if that form doesn't exist, then make it. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's encouraging. I agree with Matt. <laughs> yeah. Um, <I'm> <laughs> um, so Rachel says in classes you teach, when do you see or feel that the students have really learned something because she's sure they have another way of saying this is what are some lessons you most want to impart as a teacher? I've been saying to all my grad students this semester that the older I get, the more often the, what I say to my grad students is, that's normal. Yes, you're allowed to. <laughs> that's fine. Um, and that's the, the, so that's one half of the main thing I want to teach is this notion um, that, you know, the only reason to write is to write the only the kind of work that you can write. Um, and that you need, I tell my students um, at the beginning of the, the um, semester that, and this I've been saying for decades, um, it's probably quite boring, but that every writer should have the mantra, I am a genius with much to learn, that you need to be full of hubris and also full of flexibility, to not think that you have all of the answers, but also 
just to, to be wildly ambitious. So that's one thing. And the other thing is working hard. Um, and this is something that I think every teacher of creative writing I know says, every writer says that, um, you know, they know amazing writers from early in their um, uh, career who seem to have a huge amount of talent, um, but they just didn't know how to do the work. And that the people who seemed, you know, fine, good, but knew how to put their heads down and get work done are the ones who eventually become successful. I also think more to the point when it comes to learning how to work, that the, um, the cure for almost any writerly malady there is, is working. Like we all have giant failures of faith in our own work or nerves or feel um, uselessly competitive with another writer or something. And the way to cure those feelings is by going to your own work and working. That's good advice, if hard to put in practice sometimes. <laughs> Um, Hudson is wondering on the same note, what your kind of ideal writing day would look like, or what kind of ideal activities you would do to put you in the right frame of mind to write. So I'm not somebody, and this might be also a piece of advice that I have. I've never in my life written every day. I know there are people who work really well by going, I'm treated like a job every day. I'm going to write. Um, first of all, life does not always allow that. And I feel like there are enough reasons to hate yourself when you're a writer, to be filled with self-loathing um, and failing to write every day is like not a good one. This is this me mechanical problem. Um, but when I write, I write for long hours. Um, and so my favorite way, way to write is actually, and I haven't done this since uh, 2019 either, is to wake up very early and go to my campus office and be there at five o'clock in the morning and write until about four o'clock in the afternoon. Oh my God. And I'm so, can I just tell you, Erin, I am so smug and horrible about it. And that's one of the things is that I'm sort of like, no matter what I've written, it's not that I come out and go, oh, wow, I'm a really good writer. I'm, I feel, I come out going, yeah, I did it. Yeah, I wrote for, you know, I work. And now I'm not typing for nine hours or whatever, that's 11 hours, isn't it? Um, not a math professor. Um, I'm reading and I get up and I pace and I do all of that, but it's mostly, it's mostly writing. And it's not, I don't write more than most writers over a course of a year. I probably write less. It's just that I sort of concentrate my writing hours. But I, I do, I have a very lovely family. I'm married to Edward Carey, who is a writer and illustrator. We have two great kids. Um, I write best when I am all alone. My, my graduate students, this is me being very old, you young people, you like to write in coffee shops and I don't understand that. No, I'm with you there. Yeah. I need to be alone. If there's someone else talking, it just throws me off. Right? I write what I hear people saying. So that's, yeah. Yeah. I read what people say. And then I also, I just get furious at them because people in public are so boring. Like I don't want to, dude, I don't care about your startup. You're talking louder than anybody in this yeah. Oh, Of course, it's a dude with the startup. Just classic. Well, I'm really impressed that you wake up so early. That That's a real feat. Um, in addition to writing, you know, longer for longer chunks of at a time, you also write an abundance of tweets. So Laura is asking, how much time do you spend reading the tweets of others each day? really quite a small amount, which is, makes me a, not a good Twitter citizen. I read a little bit, but not a ton. And I try not to spend that much time on it. And I have to say, we now have a sane person for president. So I spend less time on Twitter because I'm not sort of like, something terrible is happening and I have to see what it is. Um, so I spend, yeah, I spend less. I try to, I don't, I, so this is my cell phone. It's a text phone. Um, it back, old school. Yeah. So I did, because this is because I love the internet. And um, if I had it in my pocket, I own a smartphone that I travel with, but otherwise I don't carry it. Um, 
so I only tweet from my laptop. Um, and I think I would be someday they're going to stop making these phones. And I'm terrified because if I have a smartphone in my pocket, I will actually spend too much time looking. I, I probably would have to quit Twitter then because I would just fall into my phone. I've heard they're actually making like dumb phones, which it's like a smartphone, but they, they take out like the smartphone capabilities, except for like the GPS so that you don't get lost. So maybe that would be good for you. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to them. That's really what I need. I, I have very little, all of my um, self-control and all my discipline really is sort of prosthetic. I need things. Um, when I go into work in my office for those long hours, I have my internet blocked for the entire time. I turn it off on my laptop the night beforehand. So I rise and go without looking at the internet. Um, and it's not because I am pure, it is because I am impure. And I need to stop myself from looking at it. That makes me wonder about your research practices because I often find myself, well, two things. I often find myself being like, what's the word for blah, blah, blah. And then I have to try and like Google it or find it in the thesaurus. Or, you know, I might be writing about something that I'm not a place say, or like a, I don't know, a profession and I want to learn more about that. So do you do all your research ahead of time or are you writing things? I, I also, here, I feel all wobbly because I've got my computer on three volumes of the Arabian Nights and Roger's Thesaurus. I see you are throwing it old school here as well. <laughs> yes, which is so pleasurable but looking through a thesaurus because it, it, it raises more questions than it answers. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I do, but the other thing I, I do, if I have access to the computer is I might be writing and then I think, oh, I wonder about this thing. And then like half an hour, I'm watching who's the boss. I don't even like who's the boss. I have no intrinsic interest in who's the boss. Um, but that is where my mind goes. So like, it's just much easier for me to go. Not, not right now. Any question you have can wait until tonight. That's very smart. Your, yeah, boundaries. Um, so Laura is wondering, what do you do when you have writer's block? How do you get back in the flow? And I think you said before that you just write, but how do you even get to the point where you're just writing? Um, I read. That is the, that's so um, writer's block or feeling like you can't work is the one writerly melody that it's hard, can be hard to write. Um, and then I just read work that I, that has given me pleasure in the past. Um, and that usually does the trick. Care to share any examples? Well, actually, I was thinking as I say that, that um, what I particularly like to read is, is language that lights me on fire and Paul Harding's Tinkers is one of the books that does that. And I feel like I do, it's a book I know pretty well. Um, and when I'm, <clears throat> when I'm in that state, I wanna read something I know well. Um, so I read poetry too. Um, Elizabeth Bishop is often a good mental lubricant for me. Um, the short stories of Edward P. Jones. Um, it, it helps me to read somebody, people who are not, who are pretty sweet, generous as writers so that um, I just fall into the world of them. Yeah, that, that's really interesting, yeah. Um, someone else here is wondering, Joseph is wondering, uh, what are you proudest of as a writer? And then also maybe something that is not related to being a writer? Um, proudest of as a writer, I'm incredibly vain about certain turns of phrase and metaphors um, that I am. And so there, somebody could come up to me and say, God, I really love that book of yours. And I'm like, yeah, thanks. Somebody will say, I really like this sentence on page 17. And I'm like, you, you have no idea how much that means to me. Um, maybe because it seems acceptable to be vain about a, about a turn of phrase. Um, but that's where we put so much time and energy into, you know, crafting these sentences and a reader, a reader could just blow by them. You're like, man. Yeah. Isn't that painful to contemplate? 
Yeah. Especially like when you're reading a book for plot, which I don't think anyone would do with your books, they're going to slow down and take in the beauty of the phrases. But you know, if you get excited by something, you're just, if it's a real page turner, think about how much time it took the writer to write it and how quickly someone can read it. When I'm editing every now and then I'm not, I'm pretty good about cutting my own work, but every now and then I look at a sentence, I'm like, nobody ever got a chance to read you little sentence. Oh, it used to be that I would like revise entire scenes to justify a sentence that gave me pleasure. Now I, now I cut them, but I do sometimes think. So I have a question for you actually about revision. Um, I read in an interview that Anne Patchett has said that you have the most soul crushing (laughs) revision (laughs) process of anyone. And in this interview, when you were asked to describe what your revision process was, you demurred. Um, but I wonder if you might be willing to share it with us now. I, this is more for novels and for short stories, though I throw whole short stories out, is that I write pages and pages that don't get into the book. And I revise things from start to finish all the time. Part of that, of Anne, who's a dear friend of mine saying that is, Anne is quite an efficient writer. And she also thinks a lot about her work before she starts writing it. She doesn't do an actual physical outline, but for months and months, she'll turn the book over in her mind um, and make actual decisions so that when she starts writing it, she already, already knows the book. And she also polishes as she goes along so that she's not somebody who does a ton of drafts, but she puts the time in on the sentences. Um, and so part of her is going, oh, I couldn't do that. And I think, wow, I couldn't do what you do. So, um, but particularly for my first two, I don't know, for my third novel too, I just threw out tons of pages. Um, but that's because that's the only way I know how to um, think about writing is by actually converting it into sentences. I think because I am so language based um, that I can't. I've never been able to come up with a plot before I write something. I have to write something. I have to write the sentences before I know what's going to happen. That's so interesting. That would stress me out a lot to not know where (laughs) I was going. So it's just fascinating hearing how different people approach different things. Um, I don't, I don't know that I could do it. Anne Patrick's doing either writing it all in her head, but. I I always say to my students, no process is, is incorrect that ends up with a final book. Um, I think we all have this theory that both the way we do it is the only way to, our process is the only right one. And also everybody else is doing it right and we don't know how to do it. And that there must be some secret for either composing or revision. And I think um, it's as idiosyncratic as anything is in, in writing. And Don't you just wish there was a rule book though, that we all could follow it. It would make life so much easier. <laughs> I once had a grad student who begged me to give her, she said, I know you hate doing this. I just need some rules. And I'm like, sorry. Oh, that was me last semester. <laughs> <laughs> um, Paul Harding actually just wrote into the comment that he saves his orphan sentences and he throws them in his next book. So I guess there's an idea. Put them, put all the scraps in a word box somewhere. See if you can use them again. I do that sometimes. Um, but also sometimes they're just, they're like, you know, Paul writes really beautiful sentences and I write dumb jokes that I have to take out that are very particular to the situation. Like I have a, I have a short story in this collection that's about a ventriloquist and like a funny line about a ventriloquist can only go into a story about a ventriloquist. Yeah, that one, you're not going to get too much play with that one, unfortunately. Um, Rachel is wondering when you judge competitions or when you're reading MFA applications, what are you looking for? Um, I am not looking for a well-made story. I am looking for somebody like the top thing for an MFA application is I am looking for somebody who loves the material that they're writing about thought about this a lot because there are a lot of writers who can write a nice good sentence there are um writers who write a good plot line but 
I am writing for evidence that the, I mean, reading for evidence, those things, yes, I like good language, but I'm, but it doesn't have to be beautiful language. It just has to be um, language that's doing what it wants to do. I'm looking for engagement with material that somebody is writing about stuff that's important to them. And, and there are a lot of applications. So there are Sorry. a lot of applications to MFA programs that are um, beautifully written, but boring. And they're boring because the person writing them is bored by their own material. So if you find a story interesting, that's a sign that the writer is interested in it as well, would you say? Yes. Yeah. They're interested in the people. They're interesting, interested in the situation the people are in. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Something to think about more. Um, someone else is saying that you take Alan Gerganis's advice to get your characters out of the house. I wonder how that's going for you in the pandemic times. Yeah, the the um, I've been working on I've been working on sort of two short short books, and there's a lot of travel in them um, because Alan Gerganis, who's my first teacher in graduate school um, and was just an astonishing teacher as he is an astonishing writer. He's got a new book of short stories um, that came out in January called The Uncollected Stories of Alan Gerganis. And that's what he always said. Like if, you, if your plot is stalling out, send your characters through the door and it really works. I'm gonna have to keep that one in mind next time I get stuck. Um, so I have a question about, and I'm conscious of, of time here. I know you have to go soon. So I, I have two questions. One is um, you used to be a librarian, correct? Mm -hmm. And then in your first novel, The Giant's House, the narrator is a librarian. So I'm wondering, I think it's very common for a lot of writers to pull from their real life. I think probably we're all doing that, but do you ever feel fear or hesitancy about it? Like maybe you're putting too much of yourself on the page or trouble knowing where that line is? I think that that is a giant worry for people working on their first books and I don't dismiss it. It's this huge thing that every writer I know wrestles with, that there's this feeling of, oh my God, people are gonna know things about me. My, my parents might know that I've had sex because I write about it, like I know what it is. Um, I'm worried that my parents are gonna think the parents in the story are them and that it's not them or it is them. Um, and there are a lot of things that don't get easier the longer that you write, but that's a big one that does. So I think I worried about it a lot from my first book of short stories. And now it doesn't, I'm not a tremendously, autobiographical writer. Now I'm trailing off. I did I write a very wrote a very personal um, memoir and also a ton of the anecdotes in the story that I read from actually happened to me, but the character is not me in any way. Um, and the family are not my in-laws and the the boyfriend is not in any way my my husband. And I just I use those details because they're a useful framework to to hang a story upon. And um, it, yeah, it, it doesn't worry me. I did in my collection, I did thank my in-laws in my acknowledgements and said, they're not like any like in-laws in here, but that it gets easier. It's a river you only have to cross once in your writing life. I think that that's, fear of exposure. That's comforting to hear. And it's, it, yeah, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there with some of the things you were saying people worry about, so. <laughs> terrifying, it's terrifying to think about people no it's like an exposure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my last question for you is that your latest collection is called the Souvenir Museum. Um, and I've read that you and your family collect a lot of souvenirs and knickknacks. And so I'm wondering if you can just share a favorite souvenir you've collected from your travels. Let me think I'm in this um, uh, rented space, so I can't like look around me and see um, my favorite thing that we've bought. Oh, gosh, we... We have a, um, a copper portrait of Hans Christian Andersen that we bought in Copenhagen. Um, and I really love that. But 
honestly, our house is, um, Paul Harding has been in it many times. He can tell you, it's like a, a curiosity, the old curiosity shop. It's pretty jam packed with stuff. A lot of Would bus. It's, it's like a souvenir museum. It's a little like a souvenir museum. Mm, I like it. Mm. Well, and credits. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Elizabeth. This has been so nice to get to meet you and to learn more about your writing process. Um, we're just so thankful that you had the time to spend with us tonight. It was a total pleasure. I had a blast. It was really mm -hmm. nice talking to you. Yeah, same here. Okay, well, thank you everyone for attending and uh, hope to see you guys next week at next week's Writers Speak Wednesday. <laughs>